In addition to cervical compression, we have cervical decompression, and it looks like this. Place the hand under the chin or at the forehead. I like it under the chin generally, and provide a little bit of lift for a period of one to two seconds and ask if there was discomfort there. And further than that, if the client reports that raising the head like that alleviates pain that he had, it does indicate that there's a disc involvement. Anything that impedes the vertebral artery is contraindicated. So to ascertain whether the vertebral artery is compromised in any way or shape or form, we can ask him to perform the vertebral artery test, which I will assist you, Gabe, just in doing a bit of rotation and extension about that way for a period of up to 30 seconds to try to reproduce an impingement of the vertebral artery on the right side. Proceeding then from the lamina groove, one approximate finger width about that far on this individual to right where the posterior tubercles are, and I'll show them with the left hand right there on the posterior tubercles, working with the fibers of the scalene muscles, posterior and medial scalenes. We'll work with those fibers and then just a little bit cross the fibers along the posterior tubercles. And there they are. And now looping the hand over, over the transverse processes and curling back to find the anterior tubercles of the cervical vertebrae and we'll work those very delicately. Can reach the edge of levator scapula here at the corner of the scapula. Right under the corner of the scapula is the levator scapula, which originates on four of the cervical vertebrae and is very important in any neck pain situation. So I'll go cross fiber on the attachment at the scapula of the levator scapula muscle. And if I choose to bring the arm down, then I get a little bit better slack in that muscle and can treat it <clears throat> as a unit. In addition to the thumb saver, the beveled L bar is very useful in treating the lamina groove. Once again, we have the spine here, and I can show you the Spinous processes, transverse processes, the lamina groove right here. So this is the preferred place to treat the lamina groove entirely down the spine. And we can do some good work in the neck. It's a lot easier in the thoracic spine, but we can certainly do some good work in the neck with the beveled L bar. So first find the spinous processes, move slightly off center to find the groove, place the beveled L bar in the groove, and work with the fibers and then a little bit cross fibers. I'm holding the tool like this so that you can see what it's doing. If I were to hold it as I normally do in treatment and then put my hand there, you don't see much. So I'm holding it in an unusual manner so that you can see where it's placed and the movement that it takes. When you are treating, your thumb and forefinger are always near the tip of it so that you can have good neurological input to your brain to allow you to know how to use the, the implement. But here it's placed and we go with the fibers and across the fibers. In treating the sternocleidomastoid, the all-important sternocleidomastoid that's involved in three of the four motions of the neck. Here it is, and if you want to find it, merely have your client, if you want to make sure you know where the sternocleidomastoid is, have your client just rotate the head very slightly and then ask him to just begin to raise his head off the table. And there it is. In fact, raise your head up just a little bit more, not off the table, but right there. You see the two heads. Here's the sternal head of sternocleidomastoid and here's the clavicular head. So we want to take those all together and then try to separate them. Bring your head down and back into this position. We do want it in a position of slack. Many people, you will see, treat the sternocleidomastoid by putting it in this position to find it, and then they treat it in this position. Not such a good idea because of the carotid artery under there, and it's just difficult to get to, unless 
I'm gliding it, which is perfectly fine. Can glide down the sternocleidomastoid in this fashion. That's perfectly fine, but that's only the beginning of the treatment for this all important muscle. Bring the head back on the headrest. In fact, tilt the head to the side just a little bit. And now I'm going to come around to the side and treat. You won't see my face, but you'll see how I do this now that I don't use thumbs. I used to use thumbs in this fashion, but that is difficult for these thumbs. So now I do it this way. Left hand goes under, and I want him giving me plenty of slack there, and the right hand goes right there to isolate sternocleidomastoid. Now I can work with the fibers, and I can work a little rolling, and I can squeeze. I can work up the length of that muscle in just this fashion. I can work down lower on it. I can follow it to its insertion at the sternum and the clavicle. There it is still, the sternocleidomastoid, and pulled away from the all-important carotid artery right down there, and I want to stay lateral to that in my scooping and pulling. First, we want to traction the zygomatic bone, just like this. I'll be doing this on Gabe in just a moment. Traction the zygomatic bone, and then traction the frontal bone. And then apply alternate pressure to the zygomatic and the temporal. Alternate pressure there with no movement of the head, and then switch the hands and alternate pressure just like that, not allowing the head to move. And then finally, I'm going to come around to the nasal bone. This is the nasal bone. The rest of the nose is cartilage. So I'm going to place my fingers right on the nasal bone and stabilize the forehead and move or mobilize the nasal bone against my pressure, my alternate pressure of the opposite hand. The lateral pterygoid muscle, jaw opener, is right below the zygomatic bone, right there. There's a one little finger place to place one finger and ask your client to relax the jaw just a little bit, open the jaw just a tad, a little bit more, and you'll be able to get right on the lateral pterygoid muscle. Hold pressure or treat it side to side, whatever your client can handle for jaw problems. In case of whiplash, it may become important to work the front of the neck more than you perhaps ever have. Here is a very special and yet very careful move to treat the longus coli and the longus capitis. Let me get the spine to show you that after we move the trachea aside, here's the trachea and it moves quite easily. After we move the trachea aside, then what's beneath it is bone and the muscle is right on top of the bone. So the longus coli, longus capitis, right along in here. Notice that we have complete freedom from the vertebral artery, no possibility of impeding that. There is one caution, however, that the carotid sinus is right up here near the top, and we need to be cautious never going up that high. However, treating it in the body of the cervical vertebrae, three, four, five, and six, is a very nice place to treat the longus coli and capitis. In addition to the longus coli and longus capitis, we want to treat a couple of small muscles here in the neck that affect neck flexion and are often involved in whiplash injuries. The rectus capitis lateralis and the rectus capitis anterior. The rectus capitis lateralis is located right in front of C1, the atlas, and I'll find it in this way by asking him to raise his head so that I can place my finger just in front of the sternocleidomastoid and relax, and then turning it back, and I am now right at C1. Between the atlas and the occiput is where the rectus capitis lateralis is, just like that. If we want to accentuate that even, we can resist here, resist the opening. That makes the openers work harder, the lateral pterygoid and the medial pterygoid work harder, and thereby we get a stretch of the closers. 